So when I left you uh, in the last lecture, uh, we were talking about uh, degassing techniques. Uh, I have our degassing methods and I have given you a very sketchy outline of uh, uh, the thermodynamics of degassing in terms of the chemical reactions involved uh, and also in terms of uh, you know the rate equation uh, stating that the degassing process uh, uh, is more frequently the melt phase transport control uh, and I hope you are you know acquaint, accustomed to these terms or you know these terms from your knowledge of rate limiting uh, steps or rate controlling steps. So, uh, you require to calculate the time required for uh, 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 what you call degassing up to a certain level, uh, how much uh, you know what should be the processing time uh, that uh, can be calculated on the basis of the rate equation. But as I have also indicated that there are two periods and the first period is the establishment of the pressure at which you want to carry out that is attainment of 1 millibar pressure which is the typical degassing pressure uh, in the systems uh, which are used in steel making industries and following that period the uh, you know pressure establishment period uh, then comes the processing period and it is during this processing period that the rate equation needs to be established because you will be you know calculating on the basis of that 1 millibar pressure which is not instantaneously attained but only when you have put the degasser into the tank if it is a tank degassing then only you know after some time you will be able to establish the pressure. Uh, I have also stated that it is very important that some stirring is applied and uh, the degassing reaction being a uh, heterogeneous chemical reaction uh, the site at which the degassing reaction takes place is essentially the melt ambient environment uh, uh, interface and therefore it is necessary that in slag covered littles the slag is separated out and the melt is exposed to vacuum, vacuum okay exposure of the melt to vacuum is a essential condition uh, you know, so as to create the required interfacial area and uh, we would note that these interfacial areas are not going to be the planar area for example, they are going to be many more times than the planar area because of uh, the agitation which is available. If you go to industry, if you have a chance to see an industry, I mean you can for example, in uh, those industries which use as tank degassers, uh, they, they have you know in the tank itself there are windows and through the windows you can see the melt surface. It is of course, a very risky proposition. Okay treating steel 1600 degree centigrade inside a container at a very low pressure uh, can become cumbersome at times. So, but nonetheless when things are all right if one can you know go and look through the windows in a tank degasser and see that how agitation you know extensively agitated the bath surfaces it is possible. So, uh, in the context of degassing methods two degassing uh, methods are popular one is uh, called the tank degasser which I have very briefly discussed yesterday tank degasser and the other is called the circulation degasser. Why do you and uh, circulation degasser you have two different types, but there is uh, the RH type of circulation degasser is the most popular one which is in the used in the industry. Why do you have there, these are the popular two popular versions of the industry the capital the cost here is lesser tank degasser, but more importantly this is good for smaller ladles and this is good for larger ladles and more importantly however, if a very low level of hydrogen in steel I think if you if you perform a calculation then the minimum hydrogen level possible in carbon steel will be somewhere around 0 0.78 or close to 0 0.8 ppm. Okay? So, if you if you go to 0 0.8, 0 0.9 ppm or less than 1 ppm that is what it is okay? close to the equilibrium value then you require a very efficient system and the extent of stirring in uh, you know circulation degasser as well as the exposure of the melt to vacuum is much more intense than it is in the smaller levels. Uh, in, in tank degasser and that is why the circulation degassing is popular okay, when you want to produce ultra low hydrogen steel. Okay. But if you, are, if you are happy with 1.5 ppm hydrogen, 1.8 ppm hydrogen, okay, 
and the, you do not have you know, bigger ladles. The smaller ladles, basically, I mean you know less than hundred tons. Okay, the bigger ladles uh, also uh, these are you know as you all know that I have told you uh, when I was talking about uh, discussing ladle metallurgy operations, then they are going to be you know not just one plug. There is going to be two plugs in order to start the contents of the ladles. Okay, so the agitation is pretty. I will discuss this process. So, in tank digger, sir, basically you have a tank, okay, which is also you can consider a huge container, and this container can be sealed. So, the ladle is going to be ladle with the porous plug attached and the gas bubbling continuing. So, we have taken out the ladle, we have <coughs> done calcium treatment. Uh, we have done you know first uh, aluminum uh, uh, wire feeding for trim adjustment of deoxidation then we can carry out calcium injection uh, and if necessary we can carry out also deep desulfurization process if ultra low sulfur i miss discussing this, this uh, deep desulfurization process once i finish this i will briefly touch upon that so all these processing operations are now over okay and the ladle is now uh, you know, with an overhead crane is put onto uh, inside uh, this huge tank. Okay? So, your 60 ton or 100 ton ladle is now sitting here okay? and you have the gas for okay? you have the gas injected here. So, the ladle is your ladle is here and this is your argon plume and this ladle is, is going to be now Box, uh, container is going to be now sealed. So, the gas purging will continue, the gas purging will uh, create separate out the slag making the uh, what do you call. Uh, so, this is all done under uh, 1 millibar pressure. So, you have high highly efficient diffusion pumps which are attached to the container which is continuously withdrawing. Okay? And then what happens is uh, that uh, you, you keep it for about 30, 30 minutes or so and uh, the hydrogen content or nitrogen content is going to uh, get reduced in the melt because of the chemical reaction and the kinetic equations that I have uh, told you uh, earlier. During the process of uh, you know, tank degassing, uh, we have so this, is a, this is our little. That is the level. And <clears throat> this is our cover, and so it is completely sealed, okay. And there are uh, gas outlets, of course, so to vacuum. <clears throat> so, during the process of 30 minutes. Uh, quite a bit of temperature drop can take place because the pressure is very, very low and how much that temperature drop could be about 20 degree, 25 degree centigrade. That is for a small ladle like 60 ton ladle that is the kind of temperature drop that can take place. So, that is why you have started you know uh, after heating in ladle, uh, heating the ladle in LRF, ladle refining furnace unit, we have jacked up the temperature for you know 16 up to 1620 degrees or so in order to you know initiate or start casting. Uh, at about 15, 70, 15, 80 degree centigrade and something like that. Okay? So, therefore, as the processes are going on, solid additions are being added during calcium wire injection, during aluminum wire injection, during deep desulfurization process, temperature drops and also in vacuum degassing the temperature drops. In transit, the temperature drops. So, you know that margin is created uh, during the heating of molten metal in the LRF station itself. And then we can see, and our target is that we have to heat it, heat material or heat metal uh, melt uh, in the LRF station to such a level so that, so that we are aware that during the subsequent process of wire feeding, vacuum degassing, transport, etc., how much of drop would take place. So, we will do you know uh, heat input, heat output calculation or th heat balance calculations, and we will be able to meet the target uh, uh, or the delivery temperature at the a casting bay. So, the cast you know in continuous casting station basically we are you know the operator provides uh, 
a, a, a narrow range of temperature and one should be able to now back calculate and find out that to what level the temperature in the LRF station must be jacked up such that after doing 75, 80 minutes of secondary steel, little metallurgy steel making processes, one is able to get to the continuous caster at the correct temperature. That is the challenge, okay? And that is to be done on a daily basis, on a sustained basis, okay? 24 7 for all the heats. So, this 30 minutes, as I have indicated, comprises of two different parts. One is your uh, the establishment of the vacuum that once you put the uh, ladle inside with an overhead crane, close the with a lid and start the vacuum, it will take about 10 to 15 minutes before you can get to 1 millibar pressure. And within this, after this period of time, of course, as the pressure starts to fall off, degassing require, you know, up starts. So, this reaction similarly with hydrogen also and some carbon because carbon oxygen reaction may also take place dissolved carbon dissolved oxygen reaction may also take place reestablishment of the equilibrium because pco is now no more going to be one atmosphere pressure okay pco is going to be with the vacuum uh, the pre, the pressure for nucleates here if the bubble nucleates here you know we have one atmosphere plus the ferrostatic head but that one atmosphere pressure here is going to be non existent in this particular case so it's a reduced pressure scenario so the equilibrium would you know established in one atmosphere condition would now like to also see so there would be sporadic co bubble evaluation also so the gases will be removed at the free surface this is at the surface co bubble on the other hand can be nucleated in the system and there could be vigorous amount of boiling of the surface that one can witness through the windows which are operate provided with the tank degassing operation. So, about 30 minutes of operation or so for particularly arc furnace uh, you know treated steels one on a routine basis starting from about 5 to 6 ppm hydrogen can get to <coughs> 1, 1 1.2 or 1.5 ppm hydrogen. Okay. Dehydrogenation is the most important task in uh, you know arc furnace based steel making process and that is why I have quoted uh, you know how much of reduction of hydrogen uh, one can achieve in 30 minutes of processing with respect to a 60 ton ladle. And during this process, you require in a very small amount of gas flow rate because the gas is undergoing further expansion. The pressure here is only the ferrostatic pressure. On the other hand, you know, exposed to normal atmosphere, the pressure to which the bubbles are subjected to is one atmosphere plus the ferrostatic head, but in this case, it is only the ferrostatic head. So, therefore, the expansion of the bubble is going to be. So, for a given amount volume of argon, the intensity of stirring is far more than it is under normal atmospheric conditions. So, you do not require a very large amount of gas flow rate in this particular case, a very small amount of gas flow rate and that gas flow rate could be close to the rinsing gas flow rate as I have indicated 0.1 normal meter cube per hour per ton that kind of a flow rate which is gentle stirring or industrial terminology is rinsing that is called argon rinsing operation where you are using a very small flow rate and that kind of a flow rate will suffice it to create separate out the slag exposing the molten metal surface to the vacuum and therefore uh, driving these reactions from left to the right. The circulation degassing system is a little bit more complex. Okay? There what happens is we do not have a, a container, but we have for example, the ladle. Okay? and the ladle is treated with say one porous plug. So, we have here is the ladle and then we have so that is our argon injection and then we have this is uh, you know is the called the slag eye or the plume I, okay, argon steel plume I. So, where the slag is sitting here in a normal scenario exposing uh, the molten metal to the environment. And that is why because as I have indicated all the times after the you know tapping operation is over that you will be blowing continuously argon and that steel once it is deoxidized will have less and less oxygen dissolved oxygen content in steel. So, this I is a potential site for reoxidation. Of course, if the ladle is covered, okay, in that case the extent of reoxidation is going to be 
less because the space here if it is covered then the space here is going to be filled with argon plus some air because it is not a completely sealed one okay so that's under normal atmospheric condition so slag i okay or is a potential site for reoxidation of molten and here what happens is the droplets are also ejected because of the breaking of the bubbles and those droplets create large amount of surface area and as a result of which there is going to be some amount of iron oxide formation and if you if one measures you know uh, the iron oxide content of the slag which normally should be zero because we do not intend to have any carryover slag one would find that 0 0.1, 0 0.2 or even 1 percent APO is not unlikely. But you know if you put a cover around the slag you know little uh, top in that case uh, the exposure of the plume I or slag I to the environment may not cause that severe. So, that is besides the point just I wanted to uh, you know tell you about this it is contextual. So, now the circulation degassing process. So, there is a snorkel which is going to be put inside uh, you know uh, the system and that snorkel really looks something like it has two legs one is this and the other is this. One is called the up leg and the other is called the down leg and the container looks something like this. It is a schematic one. So, we have a leg here and we could give molten metal. I will take a colored chalk and then show it to you okay. and this is like the molten metal is going to go this is the molten metal and it is going to come out like this okay and the molten metal is going to be filled the container like this and the vacuum is this is the vacuum and here what happens is that we have this is the one leg and this is the other and then here what happens we have uh, something like an lived gas which is also argon. So, the argon bubble. So, as a result of the gas injection here what happens is the bubbles tends to rise and as the bubbles tends to rise it tends to take the liquid. The liquid experiences buoyancy and as a result of which molten metal flows here and once you apply a vacuum here what happens? the you know the metal is going to be uh, exposed to the vacuum here. So, here we have no slack coverage at all. So, here intense amount of agitation can take place because of the interaction. So, this argon gas is called the lift gas and this structure which I have shown schematically is called the snorkel. The snorkel is going to be immersed inside the snorkel there is arrangement for making some trim addition also. So, one can add. So, continuously uh, vacuum is going to be you know uh, air is, you know the environment is going to be sucked out and as a result of which one will create low pressure region here and the leaf gas, gas, uh, leaf gas will ensure that fresh metal is always going to be exposed to the vacuum and thereby what happens is you have uh, you know a very highly efficient uh, deoxidation system. So, the molten metal because it enters here and it has to come out. So, the molten metal will flow out and that is how a you know, circulatory loop is created and that is why the name is called the circulation degassing system. So, and as a result of this stirring there what happens is we have a pretty homogeneous system. So, it is a well start system and therefore, fresh material will be drawn from everywhere into the leg and as a result of which uh, continued uh, vacuum degassing would tend to take place within this chamber itself. So, there also you will require that what is the rate at which you know uh, molten metal is drawn into the system. The, if you can calculate that and if you know the total amount of uh, metal in the system or in the ladle then you should be able to find out roughly that for how long you have to process steel to make, make you know assuming an ideal mixing conditions. Is, is, is prevalent in the reactor you will be able to calculate that you know uh, if you want to give exposure to molten steel uh, 
such that all the steel passes through the snorkel once, then you should be able to calculate. But that may not be enough. You should be able to calculate that time that for how long you have to treat molten steel through this such that you know enter steel having assumed that it is a homogeneous flow or an ideal flow system uh, will pass through the snorkel once. And that may not be enough. You may have to ensure twice or thrice or four times of that time which you will calculate based on the flow rate in the up. So, flow rate is volumetric flow rate is meter cube per second and there is a meter cube total number total volume is there. So, if you divide one by the other you get a time scale okay? and that time basically represents <coughs> you know uh, that uh, for to circulate the entire steel once through this particular system that is the time, but that may not be enough to give you uh, the requisite degree of uh, degassing. So, you may have to do four times of that time, six times of that time and so on and so on. So, there are parameters called circulation number etcetera which are used in order to find out that how you know how many circulations you really require in order to find out in order to arrive at an optimum value. But that is besides the points I do not want to get into that kind of a complicacy or you know discussion here. So, it is sufficient for you to note that you know because of the creation of an intense amount of area because now every element of steel is going to be exposed to the vacuum as opposed to the tank degassing system where the stirring could be you know. So, you can see that this part can be covered by slag, this part can be covered by slag, but here what happens is all the metal and assuming that all the metals are drawn into the snorkel okay, we can expect that all elements of metal liquid metal is going to be exposed to the vacuum and as a result of which we will have a very large degree of degassing achieved during circulation degassing process. So, this is a structure which can be you know with an overhead crane can be submerged partially into the ladle just like the way I have shown and then it could be lifted out. So, there is no problem you do not have to have a huge container and try to maintain vacuum over ember. So, you require a much more powerful you know it is a huge container. So, very high power you know uh, vacuum pumps would be necessary in order to establish uh, 1 millibar pressure or less than 1 millibar pressure. So, beyond less than 1 millibar pressure is rarely achievable here unless you apply you know a high quality diffusion pump. So, this much is enough for us and here also the molten metal because of its exposure will undergo a drop in temperature. So, we must as a thumb rule you know accept uh, that vacuum treatment will ensure uh, or will lead to a drop in metal temperature liquid metal temperature uh, to about 20 25 degree centigrade depending on the processing duration. And at the same time we of course, have you know heat loss from the surrounding here and then we have of course, a smaller vacuum area. So, you know this the temperature drop here may not be as severe as it is in this particular case because of the whole ladle being exposed to a low environment uh, situation. So, once vacuum degassing is over uh, basically all the processing operation is now over. Okay? And for production of clean steel it is typically done that once vacuum degassing is you know, uh, over uh, we declare that uh, this is called the lifting of the ladle. Now, the ladle is going to be lifted and taken with an overhead crane for casting that is a typical kind of a scenario. No further processing is done. Uh, after in good steel making plants. And uh, the Japanese practice is that you know in some of the Indian plants you may find that for example, calcium wire injection is sometimes done after the vacuum degassing operation. Okay? But uh, typical Japanese practice suggests that after vacuum degassing uh, basically no operation is going to be done and as a result of which what is going to happen is that if no operation is to be done there is no need for any argon injection. So, the argon plug is going to be removed the ladle will now be allowed to this is called the holding period of the ladle. So, the ladle is there it is covered there is no gas injection there is a slag layer here and then there is a metal layer here. So, the ladle is now so this is slag this is metal and the ladle is now going to be staying just standing, okay. We say it is a holding period of the ladle. Now, 
we want the molten metal holding of the ladle and this is prior to casting. How long we are going to hold? This typically varies from 6 to about 10 minutes and this allows a good cleansing operation because there is huge amount of agitation taking place in the system. Now, we want you know if there is a slag droplets which have been emulsified and which have gone into the melt, we want slag and metal to be separated, we want inclusions to float out and so on and so forth and we also ensure that the ladle is covered, it is covered with a slag layer, it is covered with a physical cover. So, there is no way that molten metal can you know undergo or come in contact with So, you do not see the plug anymore, there is no need for the plug itself. So, during this holding period, um, what happens is uh, we mostly uh, the slag droplets will separate out and the inclusions will also uh, start to move. You know, if those inclusions which are they are continuously floating, okay. So, those inclusions which may be here close to the interface, they can get removed and uh, assimilated in the overlying slack phase also. The holding period basically allows us you know uh, or helps us in the production of plain steel. We must also know that during the holding period there will be drop in temperature and that drop in temperature could be depending on the size of the ladles you know if it is big ladle for 10 minutes of holding period may account for about 6 degrees drop in temperature. Okay. So, <coughs> the ladle after the holding period is going to be lifted and then it is going to be put into the turret just above the continuous casting or if you are trying to cast an ingot okay, through the ingot casting route then. So, we are ready for the subsequent step of casting uh, operation. Now, during this period what happens is you have for example, dissolved aluminum in the system and you also have some Al2O3 which are distributed which has not. Same can be said maybe other inclusions are also there MgO Al 2 O 3 or we can say uh, calcium aluminate. Okay. I am just explaining with respect to Al 2 O 3 assuming that the steel has been killed uh, with aluminum. So, it is understood that the dissolved aluminum content during the holding period is not going to change, but the Al 2 O 3 content is going to change because Al 2 3 is an inclusion which is continuously floating. So, from the melt the Al 2 O 3 can go to the slack phase. Now, this aluminum, so aluminum is tied up as in solid oxides and aluminum is there in the dissolved, there are two components of aluminum. So, I will say that there is an aluminum total and that aluminum total is, is equal to aluminum soluble which is there in dissolved state and then I will say aluminum insoluble and insoluble means Al2O3 is not Okay, that is the common industrial terminology and it is this particular parameter that is going to be now changing as a function of time. So, therefore, if you take samples from steel and if the samples are representative okay, as a function of time, then you should be able to find a monitor because this is not going to change, this is constant. There is no chemical reaction taking place whatsoever during the holding period, but in the holding period that could be substantial decrease in aluminum insoluble. So, by monitoring alu aluminum insoluble, you should be able to find out that how much uh, you know uh, of aluminum inclusions are being floated uh, from the system itself. So, normally in insoluble aluminum, so what, what you do basically in industry, you measure the soluble spectroscopic technique, you take samples subject the samples to spectroscopy, the spectroscopy gives you total aluminum okay, as well as soluble aluminum. Okay. So, there are discrimination criteria based, when, based on which you know one can determine the total content and the soluble content not only for aluminum, but also for calcium, but also for magnesium these are all possible. And once you know aluminum soluble and aluminum total you can subtract this from this you get the aluminum insoluble. There is no direct way of finding out aluminum insoluble. So, it is finding it is found out by measuring these two quantities through spectroscopic methods. So, by monitoring aluminum insoluble in steel okay, uh, you should be able to find out or determine you know that to what extent the inclusions have been uh, floating. So, if I if you say that sir I have 
calcium also, I have magnesium also, then I will say that you monitor summation calcium insoluble plus or I would say summation x insoluble, okay, insoluble where x represents you know C A M G L etcetera. So, by monitoring the total change of uh, total change in insoluble content of calcium, magnesium and aluminum in steels where these three elements are supposed to be present because other elements are not going to be there is no other oxides. Okay? The oxides are either present as Al2O3 or as CaO or as and some oxides may uh, some, some you know, inclusions may be present as calcium sulphide also, but that is much more much less in comparison to the calcium um, Al2O3 inclusions or CaO Al2O3 inclusions in steel. So, by monitoring these are the elements which are tied up as oxides in steel, they also have both all of these we are going to have dissolved contents, but their dissolved contents are extremely small. You may note that calcium has a very low recovery, magnesium has come from refractory. So, magnesium dissolved magnesium content could be 8 ppm, uh, dissolved calcium content could be 12 ppm, on the other hand dissolved aluminum content could be about 400 ppm in steel you know at this particular stage itself. That is besides the point, but what I am saying that by monitoring the insoluble content of calcium, magnesium and aluminum as a function of holding time, you can find out that how much of inclusions have really floated, but you have to do take care that the samples you are collecting actually represents a representative sample and that needs to be you know looked at carefully well analyzed uh, carefully. So, this is you know this parameter is monitored routinely in the industry in order to find out that how dirty the steel is. Okay? If you have aluminum insoluble 0, that means the steel is completely clean which of course, is not possible uh, to attain. So, after you have you know waited for about 10 minutes, allowed the inclusions to separate out, allowed the slag to separate out nicely, it is time for you to lift the ladle. So, at this lifting condition all the parameters of the ladle are going to be monitored. For example, what is the lifting temperature, what is the lifting composition and this is the composition that is my target composition. And also you know if I have measured aluminum insoluble content. So, I know about the cleanliness and this should also correspond to uh, the cleanliness uh, parameter provided by uh, the supplier. So, the composition cleanliness and temperature are all correct. The temperature with respect to my casting temperature there is the subsequent operation. Casting we will not be able to do at any temperature. Okay? It should be close to the liquidous temperature of 10 degrees, 15 degrees more than the liquidous temperature. So, there is a caster specified temperature that is you know ensured in the holding metal. The cleanliness is we are giving holding time, we have done calcium treatment, we have allowed for enough opportunity for the inclusions to float out. So, the cleanliness, cleanliness is also satisfactory, we have done deoxidation, done alloying, done calcium injection, done degassing. So, the composition is also correct. So, the composition, temperature and cleanliness of steel now during the holding stage is the desired composition or the desired target composition and target cleanliness. And we are all set to proceed to the next stage of casting. But before I discuss the subsequent operation, okay, transfer of now the molten metal is to be timed. We have two words, one is we use in industry, these are all terminologies. Tapping, emptying of a furnace is going to be is termed as a tapping operation. Okay. On the other hand, emptying of a ladle is going to be termed as a Teaming operation. In tapping operation, the transfer of oxygen from the atmosphere is not an issue because the melt already contains a lot of oxygen because in the oxygen still making process. During the teaming process, the transfer of oxygen and interaction with that part square is very, very important. During the teaming process, teaming of a ladle, tapping of a furnace. During the teaming process, we must understand that the level of dissolved oxygen is extremely small. We have made so much of effort to remove nitrogen and hydrogen and we cannot afford molten metal to come in contact with the atmosphere now. Okay? At any cost during the subsequent transfer operation and casting operation, we must ensure that the molten metal does not get exposed unwarrantedly uh, you know, to the atmosphere. Otherwise, what is going to happen? Oxygen is going to get into steel, 
nitrogen is going to get into steel because these are all 1600 degree centigrade melt and these have uh, the metal has uh, melt has a great you know uh, solubility uh, for these species at uh, the operating uh, temperature. Before vacuum degassing you know uh, as we do calcium in injection for inclusion modification one can do uh, this I missed and I thought that I will you know before I go to the teaming of the ladle and discuss initiate that discussion. So, I just wanted to finish this up the deep desulphurization process deep desulphurization process and uh, this is a, this is also called ladle desulphurization process ok and uh, very briefly in 2 minutes time I am going to tell you and so this is before VD not after VD that must be noted. So, so we have the ladle and you all know that in steel making I have been telling repeatedly that sulphur removal to a great extent is not possible. So, we may have you know uh, 300 400 ppm of sulphur left unless we have uh, done effective pre treatment ok. So, commonly 0 0.015 sulphur is very common uh, ok. If you have not done the sulfur, deep desulphurization process, sulfur could be, and the presence of sulfur can jeopardize your calcium treatment, okay? And because when you are doing calcium treatment, I have not told you about this. We assume that the steel does not contain sulfur because this is an advanced topic, and you know I can go on and on, uh, and I do not have that much of uh, luxury of time uh, to continue into you know the calcium injection to that in that great detail. So, in steel making, so this is the scenario in aluminum keel steel we have gotten 10 ppm oxygen ok weight percentage. On the other hand if we do, we do you know have not uh, quite a you know uh, what do you call uh, efficient uh, pretreatment process and all it is very common that at the end of steel making we can have 150 ppm of oxygen ok. This is uh, very very common. Now, when you have oxygen so low 10 ppm and when you have sulphur very large and if you put calcium into molten steel ok the calcium has great affinity towards sulphur also. So, calcium for example, uh, I would say affinity of calcium towards oxygen is relatively more than sulphur and uh, the standard free energy of formation for calcium oxide is something like uh, I think close to 262,000 calorie per mole. And for calcium sulphide this is I think 160,000 approximate value calorie per mole that is what it is. So, it is not that on the other hand I would say if you write down for aluminum, aluminum has a great affinity towards oxygen the value may be 200. Aluminum does not have much efficiency you know attraction towards sulphur it does not react readily with sulphur. So, this value could be 20,000, 30,000 or 40,000 you know by applying common logic ok. So, therefore, if your sulphur content is 15 times more than the oxygen content there is a great possibility that you know during calcium injection you try to form calcium oxide, but that calcium the dissolved calcium will instead meet sul dissolved sulphur because which is abundant in the system and produce dissolved calcium plus dissolved sulphur is equal to calcium sulphide. So, you wanted to you know use calcium such that calcium is going to attack the alumina inclusions, but because you have not taken care of your sulphur. So, calcium has instead reacted with sulphur ok and produced calcium sulphide and calcium sulphide is also this notation is wrong, but it is also a solid inclusion itself. So, instead of improving the steel cleanliness by forming calcium aluminate that is C 12 uh, A 7 ok, what you have formed is calcium sulphide which is the inclusion and the steel has become dirty. So, that is why it is said that before calcium injection it is important 
that sulfur level must be brought down to a lower level. So, therefore, the deep desulfurization process that I am going to discuss, I, you must understand that before we do you know, calcium treatment, we must be doing the deep desulfurization process, bring the sulfur down. Okay? And what is the deep desulfurization process? Basically, you have a ladle and we have pour gas injection and in this case, uh, we will use an argon injection to the rate of 1 normal meter cube, the highest flow rate per ton per hour. That is the kind of values. Why it is going to be clear to you in a minute. Okay? So, we are going to add lime powder into the desulfurization for desulfurization. So, we have slag here. Okay? So, we have low oxygen. Okay? We have deoxidized the bath. So, we have large amount of dissolved aluminum content. We also have quite a bit of sulfur and we want to eliminate that sulfur and for that we have injected calcium oxide powder in powdered form solid that calcium oxide plus sulfur dissolved plus aluminum dissolved gives rise to calcium sulfide okay? and that calcium sulfide slag plus Al2. So, in the presence of aluminum and this aluminum sulfur is getting removed to the slag phase and this aluminum what it does? It ensures a neutral or a reducing environment in the system. Okay? A higher aluminum content, aluminum and oxygen are inversely related is a reflection of a very low oxygen content of molten metal. So, as a result of cal powder injection, calcium powder injection what happens is that it reacts with dissolved sulfur in the presence of aluminum and Al2O3 as a result of which is generated. Because now calcium will get, even though it has a greater affinity towards oxygen that aluminum will not go with sulfur. Okay? Sulfur is preferentially, preferentially trying to cluster around calcium looking for an opportunity that the moment aluminum oxygen is taken by aluminum you know the sulfur can latch on, on into the calcium and that is what precisely happens and that is this is a distinct thermodynamic possibility. If you do thermodynamic calculations, you will find that this reaction indeed goes from left to right. This is a slag metal reaction. So, therefore, the interfacial area is going to be very, very important. Okay? And these all require formation of new phases and the moment you put calcium oxide powder, you have created numerous solid particles. The surface area is increased and this surface area coupled with a large mass transfer coefficient because the moment you have injected powder and you have mixed the powder thoroughly, you require really a very large amount of gas flow rates. So, this is the flow rate 1 normal meter cube per ton per hour is the flow rate you will rarely use only when you require slag metal reactions you will use such a large flow rate. Otherwise, you will be doing the rinsing flow rate which is roughly about one tenth of the flow rate that is used in the deep desulfurization process. So, as a result of this what happens is the sulfur content can really go down and it can even go down below 30 ppm. So, this is the dissolved sulfur content and this is the time of desulfurization. If one uses a dual plug in bigger ladle, so this is it can go you know 10 ppm sulfur is possible, less than 10 ppm sulfur is possible and this is for one plug and this is for two plug. So, now let us come back to uh, our discussion that holding is over now we want to empty the ladle. Okay? We want to cast molten metal which is present in the uh, ladle and that is what we have to drain the ladle. The draining of the ladle Basically, we have uh, a slide gate valve here and the slide gate va valve basically are two plates. Okay? So, there are for example, if you look at the plates from the top, the plates look like this. The play, one, of, one plate will look like this. It has a hole here. This is the hole actually through which molten metal will flow and there is another plate and if you <coughs> slide this plate okay, up and down in that case you can control the size of the aperture. Why it is necessary to control the size of the aperture? 
because from Bernoulli's equation we know that as the depth of the liquid will co going to come down, so will be the volumetric flow rate. So initially, when the depth of the liquid is large, you will have a small opening of the little nozzle, and then as bath depth goes down, you will have a bigger and bigger opening. So you will pull the slide gate towards you, creating more opening such that more metal can flow out, and in this way, the slide gate valve will allow you to maintain a constant flow rate, outflow rate from the ladle to the uh, vessel below. Okay, and that is important. Uh, that we'll see uh, how important is that. That we are going to see it in a minute. Now, if you want to take out the molten metal from ladle, it is understood the molten metal will come as you know. You may think that it is going to be exposed. So, we have the ladle here and we have below the ladle, it is taken to the as I have said it, it is taken to the casting bay. The casting has to start now and the casting if you are doing casting, we will discuss that later on, you will have an ingot casting as well as a continuous casting, ingot and continuous casting. There are mold filling operation, there are going to be mold, static mold and a vibrating mold in continuous casting, static mold in the case of ingot and you will fill this with molten metal which is contained in the ladle itself. Okay? Now, during transfer of molten metal from the ladle into the mold, be it ingot, be it continuous casting, I do not want molten metal to come in contact with atmosphere. Okay? So, as a result of which there are methods by which molten metal is going to be teamed and this I am going to explain with regard to the continuous casting. So, we have a ladle. So, the ladle bottom is something like this. Okay? So, you have this is the bottom refractory, little bottom refractory and this is the little opening. Okay? And then we have the slide gate plates and then we have some kind of a uh, what is known as a collector nozzle. So, we have here draw it like this. So, this is the aperture suppose and then we have There is a nozzle fitted, and onto this nozzle we have a refractory tube which is mounted. So, it is pushed onto this collector. This facility, this is called the slide gate, which has two plates as I have indicated. You can see this you know precise design either in a textbook or in the net itself. You know, slide gate below a little, then you will understand, and these are all operated automatically, there is no manual you know, you, you have the bath depth, uh, if you monitor the bath depth uh, okay, through, through some laser device etcetera, then you should you can have you know uh, the Bernoulli's equation, a computer, a, an actuator which will move or a motorized you know device which will move the plate up and down. So, what should be the orifice diameter that can be calculated from Bernoulli's diagram to ensure a constant flow rate. So, having obtained a feedback of the depth of the liquid in the system, okay, you can have a feedback control mechanism which will itself push and pull you know, on the slide gate plate. Immediately below the slide gate plate, what we have is a collector nozzle. And this is the typical scenario in the case of continuous casting, and one can use this also. And these shrouds are this, these are also, you know, uh, as I have shown here quite long, this could be about this is called little shroud. In ingot casting, a similar sort of a little shroud arrangements can be made, but the shroud may not be that long as I have indicated here. These shrouds in continuous casting could be about 1.2, 1200 to about 1600 meters long, millimeter long. 
this is millimeter 1.6 meter long on the other hand in got casting this could be you know the ladle would be sitting on immediately the mold will be brought here the ingot mold will be brought here okay and then you will have you know a small little kind of a protective environment so the shroud really protects the molten stream it does not allow the what is the objective of little shroud we do not want to have an open air pouring okay so if you do not have the shroud the stream will get exposed to the environment we want to prevent that and it is because of that the shroud has been created which is a refractory tube is a refractory tube artifact okay and this refractory tube is mounted you know it has a tapered section so it is mounted here itself on the so the design is <coughs> it goes you know because because it is a reverse taper the taper here is like this and you imagine the shroud has a reverse taper on the top so it is going to at some point of time it is going to fix here itself i have drawn it so i should have drawn it like this then it will be clear to you so the shroud on the other hand will fit here uh, so with an yellow so shroud will fit here and shroud will fit here for example so it's a vertical tube and the shroud is going to be fitting here okay and this is that is the way it is, is it? plain and simple device. But what happens is that uh, you know this joint is never perfect because these are two refractories. The collector nozzle is a refractory, little shroud is also a refractory. So, when you try to mount the shroud onto the collector nozzle, uh, this joint often is not perfect. Okay? And as a result of which, because molten metal will be flowing at a very high speed okay this low pressure region causes some amount of atmospheric air to get in now if you have measured nitrogen content here immediately before the little lifting for casting and if you now measure for example the nitrogen content at the shroud exit if the nitrogen content changes or if there is an increase in nitrogen content that is an essential indication that molten steel has come in contact with atmospheric air and therefore, you can consider that the shroud collector nozzle joint is not perfect and air must because there is no other way nitrogen can come. Okay? Oxygen can come for example, there is a slag there are refractories which contain oxygen some can come from there, but nitrogen there is no source of nitrogen it is only the atmospheric air. So, if the dissolved nitrogen in the ladle. Okay, and dissolved nitrogen at the shroud exit differ or I would say there is, there is a nitrogen absorption or nitrogen pickup during the travel of the molten steel through the shroud this is an essential indication that air has got into the shroud and therefore, some amount of reoxidation of steel has taken place as a result. So, we would say that if you can achieve a perfect ceiling then this nitrogen content and this nitrogen content has to be exactly similar exactly identical, but getting 0 nitrogen pickup that means, this nitrogen here okay, at the shroud exit and minus this nitrogen getting it 0 is perhaps next to impossible. The best practice perhaps in the world is about 2 ppm of nitrogen absorption during the transport which says some amount gets into it. When nitrogen content is very small in that case one can consider essentially that the entire space is filled up with molten metal because there is very little amount of nitrogen pickup. So, in a leakage scenario the tube is going to be completely filled up with liquid metal okay? the shroud is going to be completely filled up with metal. On the other hand if you have 20 ppm of nitrogen pickup in that case we can assume that there are going to be lot of bubbles etcetera in the system. So, there is going to be a two phase flow within the shroud itself we will continue our discussion you know of, of the teaming operation which is very important, but during the transfer operation one would note that there is not going to be significant amount of temperature drop calculations indicate that in the little shroud typically in industry 1.8 to 2 degrees of temperature drop can take place the surface temperature of the shrouds are of the order of you know, 800 900 degree centigrade. So, there is a radiation loss operating through the shroud wall 
okay? and as a result of which drop in temperature takes place, which nevertheless is not significant. We will continue tomorrow.